Okay. Does it say recording on other people's screen? Did it come up? Okay, yeah. great, thank you. I can't see it. Um, all right. So um, to start out, let's take a moment um, and reflect um, on the ways that we were brought together over time. Um, at Maryland's Built Environment School, we believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those that have been historically and systemically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on virtually, but otherwise would be in person on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who are among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respects to Piscataway elders and ancestors. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, settlement that bring us together here. All right, so again, we are excited to have Adrian Brown for our lecture today. Um, and the theme of the public programming um, that we have been reflecting on this semester is fault. The charge of the fault lecture series acknowledges that as architects and spatial thinkers, we are trained in the research design and management of assemblies. But we have undeniably been existing on a cultural, political, environmental, and moral fault line. Through the public lecture series and events of this semester, we aim to reflect on the loss, fissure, and inequities amplifying around us. And at the same time, we aim to understand the constructive paths towards uh, forward from fault to ownership, understanding, and change. Um, also, uh, thank you, thank you very much to the Guy Lombardo lecture fund for supporting ongoing learning through public programming and the architecture program. So with that, I will hand it over and stop screen sharing. Okay, let me share my screen. And normally there'd be, you know, a big round of applause, but we'll <laughs> have to imagine I didn't tee up, you know, any, any clips. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm excited for a great conversation and afterwards we'll have time for conversation. If anyone has questions during the presentation, feel free to write them in the chat and I'll moderate at the end. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, you should see a black screen. Is that what people see? Okay, good. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today and share um, some new work, uh, work in progress, um, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited to be here in like a general mode of excitement. I'm particularly excited to be speaking at UAP, which is my alma mater, go Terps. Um, I had the Terps going all the way in both my men's and women's bracket, even though I knew that was likely to end in heartbreak, but I committed. Um, so I'm excited to be at Maryland. Um, and I'm also in particular really excited to be at the School of Architecture Planning and Preservation, right? I spent a lot of time as an undergrad. Um, I was an English major. Um, architecture was not going to ever be my thing. I have terrible depth perception and no like spatial common sense. Um, but I was always deeply fascinated by my time at Maryland um, by uh, the work that architecture students were doing and the different forms of perception that thinking about and intervening in the built environment requires. requires. Um, so listen, in spending time, not just in architectural history courses, which I also took, but around architecture students who are my friends, um, who are just kind of in studio, as you are <laughs> all the time when you're an architecture major, um, that I started to get interested in the different kinds of perceptual knowledges that one learns as a humanist, which is myself and as an architect. Um, seeing up close how my friends um, were architecture majors approach problems, thought in tactile ways with models and materials, and we're being literally trained to see, inhabit, and reproduce types of perceptual modes that are, that are in excess of how we see our everyday lives. Like you don't see the world in sections, right? You have to learn how to do that. And I was always just like, wow, you just see in a, in a way that I cannot access, right? Um, and, you know, it was, um, I was really interested in that form of perception. I consider myself a scholar of perception, and I think it really started in thinking about the different ways architects see 
versus the ways that I was thinking about how writers see the world and are, are also interested in new forms of perception, um, visibility, vantage point, often reproducing that in ways that we also don't <laughs> occupy in our everyday lives. Um, so it was kind of in the thinking about those two modes um, and their connections and their impasses that really seeded um, my first book, The Black Skyscraper, and all of my work, which is really around thinking about race, architecture, representation in the built environment. Um, so I just want to note that I owe a real debt to UMD, um, to the architecture school in particular, and even more particularly to the architecture undergrad class of 2005, um, who ultimately, um, it turns out, shaped the path of my research for up, up until the present, I think for a long time um, afterwards. So thank you for allowing me to be a general gawker and stalker in the building. Um, and a particular shout out to Brittany Williams, who was my roommate, who made it made all that commingling possible. So um, I just wanted to note that. Okay, so let me get into, into the to the nitty gritty. So uh, before talking about some of the new work, I thought it might be helpful to just quickly talk about um, my first book. Let's see if I'm getting PowerPoint going. There it is. Um, the Black Skyscraper, Architecture and the Perception of Race, which came out in 2017. And uh, I bring it up because it really, um, a lot of the questions that I'm thinking about now came out of questions left open in this book. So I thought I'd just gesture it to it um, a little bit. So. Um, in the Black Skyscraper, I consider how a range of figures at the turn of the 20th century imagine the skyscraper to potentially negate or muddle race as something read from the body or experienced by one's own body. So kind of recapturing the drama of what it meant for a 10-story building to be the tallest building in many cities, um, you know, in the mid-18, in the mid, uh, in the mid uh, around 1860, 1870, 1880. And to jump into something like the Empire State Building's 102 stories in 1930, right? Like what a change in scale, what a change in, in how people, you know, viewed themselves in relationship to the built environment. So trying to capture some of the drama of that scalar change, but also thinking about how that scalar change also really sh shaped and impacted how people thought about um, how they could have access to race as so something they could read from other people's bodies, um, but also as something that they experienced themselves, understood themselves as racialized subjects. So the book recounts how Americans grappled with how race was to be read or might endure as a meaningful category in cities in which bodies were hard to see and therefore know, be it from the top floor of the skyscraper where everyone looks like dark ants or specks, which you get a lot of writers um, kind of fixated on trying to describe what it means to see the body at these new heights and the way that everyone is kind of flattened into one kind of pers perspectival um, plane but also at the crowded streets of its feet where the skyscraper is producing and making possible all you know, new forms of density, right? And people are moving up and up close with a range of people and mixing in new ways, um, spatially in the midst of uh, you know, really intense waves of migration um, and immigration, right? They were also kind of creating, um, compli that were complicating categories of racial understanding. Um, so I'm interested in the ways that the built environment, and particularly through the early skyscraper in this period, was, just, was accused of distorting the racial sign and trying to recover the story of how the skyscraper was read by architects, writers, journalists, and a range of figures as, uh, as a kind of racializing structure. Um, so in pursuing this story about the skyscraper, I make the case for thinking about how architecture more broadly is always shaping the perceptual life of race and for attending to architecture as it produces the material conditions through which the racial sign appears, right? So it's like the skyscraper for me is a test case for thinking about this, this broader truism, right? About the ways that the built environment is always changing and part of the ways that people understand what it means to have an experience of race um, and trying to think about how scale and vantage point are, are part of that kind of more visceral act of racial perception that we often kind of, um, <laughs> don't sit with for a long time, right? To think about race as a structural category, which I think about as well. Um, I'm gonna plant a quick little seed here for Q and A um, and just say that I have a lot more to say about how my time at, at UMD and growing up in the Maryland suburbs shaped the origins of this book and the book I'm writing now and my general interest in race, architecture and literature, which I started thinking about at Maryland in my senior thesis on race in the suburbs and literature. 
feel free to ask me about that later on. Um, if I start talking about it now, I'll get off track and I'll never find my way back. So just planting that seed. Um, okay. So let me start talking a little bit about the new the new work um, where I'm pivoting my focus really from architecture to real estate and realizing like some of the questions that I had about architects and architecture needed to needed to uh, to take more seriously the ways that people were theorizing real estate and property to make sense of this larger picture of, of the race in the built environment that I wanted to paint. So in the epilogue of the black skyscraper, I locate the afterlife of the story that I tell there, um, not so much in contemporary skyscraper structures. I do talk a little bit about race in the Middle East um, and the ways that the kind of labor conditions, migration conditions are kind of creating, um, you know, are impacting racialization um, um, in terms of kind of newer mega structures in the Middle East, or you could think of a, a gesture a little bit to 9-11 and, um, and um, some of the battles over, uh, uh, over the mosque that was going to supposed to go near the site and the ways that racialization continues to help the scraper, but I'm not really so much, I don't so much locate the afterlife of the racial story that I find in the sky, the early skyscraper and contemporary skyscrapers, but rather in the mass suburb at the mid-century, which I argue helped to rescue whiteness as a perceivable and appraisable category from the urban spaces that had threatened to erode its distinctiveness. Um, and so uh, this geographic movement to the suburbs engine, engined a reorganization of how people thought whiteness was, what it meant and how it was experienced um, away from per perceivable, perceivable corporeal traits like race is in the body to race being um, more kind of firmly grafted to home ownership status and location in the mid century, which I'll talk a little bit about that process. Um, so this story is at the heart of my second book, which is tentatively called Residential Forms from the Rent Party to the Fair Housing Act. I don't love that title, so if you have a better one, I will gladly hear it. Um, focusing on how America's transition to becoming a nation of homeowners for the first time in the mid 20th century, remade categories of race and by extension, description and affect. The move to mass home ownership to in uh, the 20th century, perpetuated by new financial mechanisms like the 30 year mortgage, redlining's perceptual mandates, which I'll talk about in a second, and the birth of new sciences like appraisal and land use economics, which really come into their own as discrete fields in the early 20th century in the US. Um, and we're borrowing from older forms of race science from the 19th century. Um, it's in the midst of all of those different kinds of things that I'm arguing um, that mass home ownership altered how Americans experienced the neighborhood as a social, spatial, and most important for me as a racial unit. So what does it mean to think about the neighborhood as a racial unit? How does the neighborhood start to get racialized as a, uh, as a, as a unit itself? Um, so in the first half of the talk, I'm gonna just kind of try to give a broad overview of some of my obsessions in this project. Um, in the second half, I'm gonna to pivot towards some new work um, um, specifically focused on the 1930s. So I'm gonna focus there on the different ways that uh, two writers, W.B. Du Bois, and Richard Wright understood the broken promises of 40 acres and a mule, which is often like, um, you know, stands in for reparations more broadly. I'm trying to think about the ways um, they are, they're rethinking the concept of 40 acres and a mule and reparations in the 30s, in the wake of both the Great Depression and the Great Migration, um, as both of those things are raising questions about the utility of property more broadly as a vehicle for freedom. Um, uh, so I'm gonna, that's where I'm gonna kind of end up. So just to give you an arc and a map. Um, okay, so let me begin here with, with this quote. Um, this quote has long haunted the project. This is kind of in some ways the, pro the quote that I've been thinking about the longest that is, is the seed for this work and the quote that I'm continually coming back to. Um, this is a quote from Herbert Hoover um, from his 1931 presidential address to the White House Conference on Home Building and Home Ownership, which was held just after the Great Depression, um, or just after the, um, um, the kind of realization that the country was in a Great Depression. Um, and the conference was designed to spur new home construction and home purchasing. And Hoover had been involved in um, home ownership and promoting home ownership uh, for much of the 20s, this is the uh, Secretary of Commerce, um, and he had kind of instituted the states, the federal government's first 
like real interventions in the residential home ownership market by partnering with real estate um, guilds to, for own your own home campaigns to really push home ownership as, as not just a financial, um, a, a good bet financially, but as a kind of civic engagement. So Hoover had already been doing this work for a decade and when he becomes president continues to remain a priority. Home ownership um, remains a priority for him. Um, Despite the conference's social science emphasis, convening real estate developers, tradesmen, and city planners, but also decorators, doctors, and psychologists, there was also a, a, a specific um, session devoted to Negro housing, um, which I talk about in the kind of longer version of this. Um, so despite all this kind of very serious social scientific energy at the conference, um, the president, President Hoover, in his own remarks, um, primarily turned to song lyrics as evidence of home ownership's naturalness and necessity. Um, so this is where this quote comes from. He says, quote, there is a wide distinction between homes and mere housing. Those immortal ballads, Home Sweet Home, My Old Kentucky Home, and The Little Gray Home in the West were not written about tenements or apartments. They are the expressions of racial longing which find outlet in the living poetry and songs of our people. Um, so that quote, is very interesting to me for a number of reasons. But I'll keep going. Hoover, Hoover went on to rightly contend that Americans, quote, never sing songs about a pile of rent receipts before concluding that, quote, to own one's own home is a physical expression of individualism, of enterprise, of independence, and of the freedom of spirit, end quote. Okay. So Hoover's um, kind of soaring property boosterism, which probably sounds familiar to you because, I mean, this is the language that gets adopted to talk about home ownership broadly through much of the 20th century, it's language we associate with the American dream. I mean, this was newer language in the 30s. So Hoover's, you know, it's hard to like imagine a time when that was not the language around home ownership, but it really wasn't for much of, uh, of the previous century, which I'll talk about in a second. But this soaring um, property boosterism anchored in truisms about innately racial longings for property peddled for centuries prior and absorbed by modern real estate guilds in the early 20th century, largely succeeded. His conviction regarding the national hunger for ownership would go on to anchor the American dream, an aspiration made all the more achievable with the invention of the 30-year mortgage after the Great Depression and um, by the intervention of the federal government subsidizing um, and subsidizing mortgage insurance. Uh, the federal government's interventions in the mortgage market helped the majority of Americans, mostly white, to own their homes for the first time in 1950, mostly homes mostly located in all white neighborhoods. Home ownership rates for minorities also rose in this period, but at a far slower pace, helping further cement the story, albeit a segregated one, of America as a nation of homeowners. And again, that officially happened in 1950, where we get a majority of Americans as homeowners. Um, so while the ground Hoover laid in the 1930s eventually helped many Americans own their homes by mid-century, the cultural landscape around him proved far more vexed than his stroll through the National Songbook suggests. Hoover's remarks sidestepped Upton Sinclair's sensational warnings about the evils of contract buying in 1906 as the jungle, Jane Addams' 1911 stirring descriptions of her settlement experiment, and Sinclair, Sinclair Lewis's deflation of real, realtor speak, touting homeownership's relentlessly sunny future in 1922's Babbitt. He further excised the rent parties that Harlem Renaissance writers and musicians described in the 1920s that did, in fact, manage to turn rent receipts into songs. So he was just wrong about that. People were singing lots of songs about rent receipts. Um, and the president failed to anticipate the ongoing literary and cultural resistance and ambivalence about homeownership by left-leaning writers like Richard Wright and John Steinbeck, but also on the other hand, someone like a, the libertarian novelist, Josephine Lawrence, who we don't read anymore, but she wrote this book that was the first book to mention the HOLC um, and describe it as kind of terrible policy for you know, rescuing um, homeowners uh, from their own um, moral lapses. So for every ballad sanctifying the own home as the sweetest, there was another tale attesting to its inequities, hardships, and alternatives. And that's what, in part, what this book is trying to capture. Um, it, it, residential inform, forms insist that the spatial canons that have come to organize American aesthetics and American culture in the 20th century, um, things from a literary perspective that we tend to understand as things like urban realism as a genre, cosmopolitan transnationalism, 
suburban literature that's melodramatic, middle brow, and postmodern in its in its varieties, um, and the residual modernist rural. We could take away all the aesthetic categories and just say the urban, the suburban, and the rural um, have obscured home ownership's broader impact on the entwined histories of perception, race, aesthetics, and valuation that supersedes regional typologies. So I focus instead on the residential, a concept spanning the urban, suburban, and rural that denotes the growing financial and ideological investment in home ownership mediated by state policies, private real estate markets, and modes of racial surveillance, buttressing the profitable business of spatial apartheid. The residential first emerged as a concept within bureaucratic discourses of zoning and real estate. And part of what I'm trying to do is track, like when is the residential as a concept, um, not just kind of technically emerged, become embraced as a, as a category and a mode of living um, um, that's recognizable and legible um, as an experiential category, but also recovering its dual function, the dual function of the residential um, as a bureaucratic category, but also as an experiential category, shaping how Americans perceive space, read both bodies and books, assessed value, and felt sovereign in relation to the spaces they called home. Um, I should say the slide that I'm showing is just like a hodgepodge of some of the things that I talk about in the book. Um, so I'm not, obviously I can't talk about all of these things, but it just gives you a sense of the kinds of cultural items, bureaucratic items, professional guild items that um, I'm all, I'm kind of trying to work with. So at the heart of this project is the story of how modern housing remade conventions of racial perception. The foremost factor in maintaining the US housing market stability after the depression as dictated by, the, by both the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, and the private lenders following its lead was the establishment of hard and soft forms of racial accounting colloquially known as redlining. And you know that's an old story at this point that I think has gotten renewed attention recently, right? But um, there's a tr very long tradition of telling the story of redlining, which I'll, I'll invo invoke in a second. Um, financially disincentivizing racially mixed neighborhoods and subsidizing predominantly white ones while ensuring blacks paid higher interest rates and rents for worse housing. Redlining engineered not only new racialized geographies, and this is the intervention I'm hoping to make, but new perceptual strategies for assessing and valuing race. That redlining itself was not just like a bureaucratic policy, it was actually a mode of sight and vision and perception. And that's what I'm trying to kind of trace. Like what does it mean to see <laughs> in the wake of redlining, right? How did it change the ways that people thought about and conceived of what race was as a category and as an experiential um, form? So that's, that's what I'm up to in this book. Um, okay, um, let me say a little bit about the archive that I'm working with. The archive that I'm thinking about in this project is constituted by what I call the literatures of residential segregation. And um, that archive encompasses not just like literary fiction, though I do write, a, I do think a lot about that, but also documents, forms, manuals, reportage, professional journals, and maps that variously represent um, descriptive processes of appraisal and valuation used to assess, maintain, and at times question the inter intertwined protocols for perceiving and assessing racial difference in residential space. So let me unpack that a little bit. Um, the materials I take up treat the work of seeing and knowing race on the block as a problem and as work, a matter of scientific, perceptual, historical, or financial deliberation requiring a variety of perceptual strategies at a time when racial categories themselves are being remade rather than treating race as a self-evident fact. So I think too often we're talking about redlining, we kind of take those maps as truth, where it's like, okay, well, this is where the uh, black neighbor was, this is the white neighborhood, this is the Polish neighborhood, right? And I'm kind of interested in the blurry ways that those categories themselves are being troubled and remade in the act of making those maps themselves, right? Um, and so when people were had to think like, well, how do I talk about what this neighborhood is? It's a mixed neighborhood. What is it mixed of? Like, how do I describe what that is? And, and what is a racial difference versus what is an ethnic difference? And how do I, you know, capture that in a map? Those are the kinds of processes that I'm trying to like complicate, not complicate, but to actually recover how complicated they were in the period themselves. Um, so the literatures of segregation thusly encompasses materials emerging from professional real estate housing and appraisal discourses, but also modes of other modes of urban observation, historical recovery, and cultural imagination, exploring the methods for and the utility of looking closely at and valuing residential space and the practices and capacities for ownership attached to racialized bodies. Writers variously describe, bolstered, and rebuked homeownership's changing cadences 
in forms ranging from the literary to the bureaucratic. So consider for me, uh, a really interesting case is um, a host of writers like Thomas Pynchon, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison and James Baldwin all set aside fiction at various times in their career in the mid century to take up modes of urban reportage. So they had to drop fiction, right? And turn and look at their own neighborhood and say, what is here? What, how do I see this place, right? And so thinking about, well, why, why can't they do that in fiction? Why do they have to turn to reported? What does that make av available to them? And who, do, who does that signal who they're talking to, right? Who are they trying to battle in the public sphere for kind of an ownership over the language of the residential? Um, and I argue it's really this language of, of, of urban planning, of realtors, of appraisal, right? And we have to kind of think about these spheres as um, kind of more entwined than we usually do. Um, when such readers, writers implored their readers to look more closely at undervalued neighborhoods, we might ask what their imagined acts of looking accomplished, uh, what they imagine these acts of looking to accomplish in the wake of the professionalization of residential description in real estate and urbanism, which is a fairly new phenomenon. Inversely, professional property appraisers posited themselves in manuals and textbooks as trafficking not in subjective assessment reducible to the merely literary, but as producing empirical facts about race and its market effects. The story of how these notional speculative systems of racial appraisal and real estate appraisal shaped one another is not just one for economists and urbanists to tell. It is also fundamentally a story about the production of racial perception shaped by housing's crucial role in stabilizing whiteness as property and a possessive investment to invoke Cheryl Harris and George Lipsitz. Okay. All right, one last little piece before I get into some examples. The section is why the humanities? <laughs> what is there new to say about the story and, and what can the humanities do to the story? So a key question of this book is that one, right? What can the humanities contribute to our understanding of home ownership, redlining, and segregation, not just in terms of evidence saying like, well, what happens when we look at the literary, right? Um, but in regards of method, like how do we read these archives and race itself, right? So it's not just like, let's look at books, but like, is there a different approach we can take to the evidence that we have of redlining um, um, in the mid-century and read it differently? Um, so while homeownership's ascension in the 20th century has primarily been charted by social scientists and historians, and these are just some of the landmark books uh, <laughs> that have told the story of race, property, and housing in the US, and I've learned very much, I consult all of these books constantly all the time still, and I'm definitely working in the tradition of them. Um, I argue that the, the mechanisms, observational modes, and genres, both ordering and ordered by mass home ownership, are a constructive part of the history of perception in American aesthetics. Like, like the shift to met, mass home ownership shaped a lot of things in excess of just home ownership itself. Like it changed the way that people thought and saw what race was and how it worked. If real estate governs, as Reinhold Martin contends, residential forms attends to the range of narratives that give shape to this governance, while considering how narrative both facilitates and disrupts property's reign in moments of bloom, stagnation, and crisis. The cases made for and against home ownership in the early and middle 20th century relied on prescriptions about how ownership should feel, what kind of perception homeowners and appraisers should adopt, and the reliability of one's racial sensorium to make judgments about the present and future value of a neighborhood, which is fundamentally what appraisal is, right? Speculation about how uh, in the mid-century largely and still today, a white bourgeois potential owner would value this property, right? So it's really about this, like people talked about appraisers tried to sell themselves as working in an empirical scientific tradition, right? But so much of what appraisal is when you're talking about race and appraisal it is about inhabiting a sensorium uh, to assess how someone will value this property in the future. So I'm trying to like, sit in that weird, sticky, phenomenological space of appraisal that often gets covered over, right? Or, um, or if we talk about it, we don't talk about how, what people are actually doing when they're inhabiting that kind of perception. So determining the value of a single home or of home ownership more broadly, despite often being draped in the language of the free market, often relied on and still relies on perceptual, aesthetic, and phenomenological evidence of race and its sensations exceeding discourses of empiricism and land economics, seeking laws of value. So if we consider redlining, which is the, again, the practice of devaluing certain neighborhoods in relation to their racial makeup, 
not just as a bureaucratic procedure, but as a perceptual system, then we must consider the discursive field of real estate as not only reacting to race as an index of property value, but remaking how race was seen, surveyed, and managed. So that to, to, to try to capture this much more muscular role that real estate played in changing how people thought about race itself. They weren't just reacting to pre-established categories of black, white, other, right? They were actually remaking these categories as they went for a new kind of financial system anchored by mass home ownership. And that's the story that I'm trying to kind of recover. And then I think humanities have to help be a part of helping to recover. Um, real estate incentivized racism by financializing its assumptions while bureaucratizing its maintenance. Residential home ownership changed not only how people saw race, but who was tasked with assessing and surveying it, shifting the onus of racial litigation from residents to realtors, lenders, and government officials who largely determined who could purchase in specific neighborhoods. I tend to the honing of this institutional racial perception, seeing race like a bureaucracy that was central to redlining's operation. So while scholars have treated maps of redlined metropolitan areas as historical evidence, I focus on who was doing that surveying and under what matrices of racial observation, approaching redlining as both a perceptual system that produced habits of racial sight and uh, an accounting of racial population. So just a quick example, this is um, an FHA um, uh, map of Chicago. This is actually the only FHA map that survives. Um, uh, most of them were destroyed, we don't, or we don't know where they are. The map that you tend to see, if you can see in this tiny corner, this cover of Richard Rothstein's book, The Color, Color of Law, those more pastel images, if you may have seen, if you've seen a redlining map, those are from the HOLC from um, the 30s, uh, 20s and the 30s. The FHA, FHA, FHA maps um, have um, somehow mystically been destroyed, uh, but one remains. This is a copy that uh, the Chicago Housing Authority actually made of an FHA map when they were starting to build housing projects in Chicago. So that's how we have this map. Um, and you can see, you know, the kind of classic um, uh, redlining logic here where you have districts, um, you know, um, distinguished by color and by alphabet um, uh, figures, right? And A uh, was largely um, um, white neighborhoods that um, planners thought would stay white, right? And neighborhoods that were DNC um, were often either mixed race um, or predominantly non-white neighborhoods that were devalued. Um, and considered um, bad bets for investment, for mortgages, um, for housing loans of any kind. Um, so we these maps are, we know about these maps, but I'm interested in, again, like who was going around and making these maps? And for each little block that we see, what categories were they using to describe the racial categories that will go to inform these redlining maps that largely if you still stick them over cities, right? They still, they still are accurate in terms of describing sites of of racial sediment and disinvestment, right? So these maps were a big deal. So understanding, well, how did they get made? What decisions about race were being made? Were people being interviewed? Um, this is not long after the moment of the one drop rule, when it, what it meant to be black, for instance, had nothing to do with what you looked like, but it had to do with whether you had one drop of black blood somewhere in your family, right? The definition of what race is and how you see it and know it was under much pressure in the late 19th into the 20th century and beyond, right? So trying to understand, well, what strategies were they using to make these judgment calls? And you can see a lot of these sheets, right? Where appraisers, evaluators are going around and trying to, and writing notes about their decisions, right? So I'm interested in that moment of decision. Um, and like, what were they seeing? How were they learning to see race to make these judgments that, that would have these catastrophic effects, right? Um, so that's part of what I'm up to. Um, this is another kind of um, example that, um, drives the project. This is from Homer Hoyt's 100 Years of Land Values in Chicago. Homer Hoyt uh, went to the University of Chicago and um, uh, uh, was trained in land economics, which is kind of a new field in the 20th century, um, came, coming out of New Chicago sociology. Uh, and his, his ideas about land and land valuation would become hugely central to things like the, federal, like the FHA's understanding of how to value land. Um, uh, so this is really the architecture for um, the state policies around redlining. Um, and so one thing he cites in this, in, um, in his book is um, this kind of list of, of detri of um, list of, uh, I'll just read what he says, the ranking of races and nationalities with respect to their beneficial effect upon land values. 
Um, so we have number one, English, German, Scotch, Irish, Scandinavians, all as one, one category, North Italians, Bohemians, Czechoslovakians, Poles, and at the bottom we have Negroes and Mexicans. So there's nothing that's surprising about this list. It, it, tra it, 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 it uh, maps onto ways that white supremacy works and has worked for a long time. But what's interesting to me is, A, just the, the differences between these categories. In 1933, by the time we get to 1950, these categories would be collapsed, right? <laughs> we wouldn't have 10 categories. We'll, we would have maybe four or five categories, right? And that, res that is suburbanization and mass homeownership that produces these different categories of race. But I'm also interested in the ways in this footnote that isn't that I attached here from the book. It really, in real life, isn't right next to this. This list was prepared chiefly by John Usher Smith, the West Side real estate broker. We don't know who he is, where he got this list from, but this list would become hugely influential, right? This list becomes transposed and transmuted into racial truth and racial gospel about appraisal and valuation values, right? So how, just how much the, the residential um, market and the ways that they were thinking about race was built around faulty race science, around rumors, around hunches, um, <laughs> around guesses, right? When you start to trace like, where were they getting this information? Um, it goes back to often someone like John Smith, West Side real estate broker, right? So just trying to understand that history and like, who was this guy and what was he seeing? Um, and this is clearly just for Chicago, right? Like there's no Asians listed on this list, right? So, you know, like how were people making these lists regionally that then become kind of regulated nationally that have such effects that become maps that become laws, right? Fundamentally, right? So um, that's kind of what I'm trying to trace. Okay. All right, so let me, um, okay, let me go to this last part of the talk and I'm, I'm gonna have to speed through a few things, but I'll make it work. Um, okay, we have until so, um, we have yay, until, Lindsay. Yeah, I was just gonna say, we have until six, so we have plenty of time. So as long as you wanna spend on anything, it's great, try to interject, but um, yeah. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to leave as much time for Q&A as we can. Um, cool. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, all right. So let me talk a little bit about the origins of real estate in the U.S., um, which is really important to the story that I'm trying to tell. Um, so scholars in the social sciences have long studied the racial covenants, the zoning ordinances, and neighborhood violences used to maintain residential segregation as law for decades and as practice for much longer. We know when, um, you know, um, residential segregation becomes illegal with the Fair Housing Act that violence and, and you know, under the table practices and help to maintain and still continue to main segre maintain segregation far beyond the law. But less well studied is the degree to which the philosoph philosophical arguments made by the first generation of professional realtors for mass home ownership were racialized from their earliest conceptualization combining the rhetoric of scientific racism with vaguer platitudes about the health of civilization, the family, and the state. In other words, mass homeownership did not merely become a vehicle for residential segregation in the mid-century. Rather, realtors conceived of modern American homeownership as a racial enterprise from the start, designed to cater to Anglo-Americans deemed innately built for it. Um, a shared belief in property as a principally white capacity helped to unite the real estate industry as a national profession at the turn of the 20th century, a profession that would go on to play a large role in shaping both state and private housing policy to the present. So let me first back up and tell a story about, there we go, uh, about home ownership rates in the US before the 20th century. So, um, and that's what this map does. Sorry, it's so small, but I'll try to read it out to you. Um, so home ownership rates in the US slowly declined between 1890 and 1920, uh, which is what this line here is. You can see it's a slow decline, but it's a steady, steady one, um, largely hovering you know, around 45%. Um, so while 19th century governmental incentives like the Preemption Act of 1841 and the Homestead Act of 1862 encouraged continued white settler, settler colonialism in the form of private ownership in the Western frontier, the industrializing economy of the late 19th century drove a growing number of Americans towards urban centers where they were much more likely to rent than to own. And that's what these numbers really reflect. People moving away from farmsteads, um, moving into cities and not really um, caring so much about owning wherever they lived in the cities. Um, 
I can, there's a more complicated story than that, but that's like the broad strokes. Um, for an increasing number of Americans to own one's home was no longer to own the means of production, generating their living from the land, making residential ownership more a luxury than a necessity, a moral call, calling, or even a goal. So like if home ownership isn't described as like the civic thing and, it, and it, it's not actually making you money, well, why do it, right? There was not yet a cult around home ownership so much um, in this late 19th, early 20th century period. Um, the difficulty of securing home financing for most coupled with a plethora of new investment options other than the home further contributed to ownership's decline in this period. For those with the means to buy a home, the home was just one investment choice among many, including stocks, bonds, commodity futures, right? If you wanted to invest, there's a lot of new options in this period for doing that. Um, and for those of lesser means, home financing was far more onerous at the turn of the century than it would become after the Great Depression when the state starts to intervene. So lenders generally required down payments of as much as 50% and granted mortgages for much shorter terms of five to 10 years. You would have to renew. You'd have to renew your mortgage every five to 10 years. Plus the 50% down payment, right? Put home ownership out of reach of a lot of people. Um, it was largely thought of something you did when you retired. Uh, which may be where we're going now <laughs> with the way that homeownership is, is working. But um, so that was, that it was just very difficult to get the lending, um, to get the loans. Facing eroding homeownership rates, the National Association, oh, let me, before I go on to that. So you can see this downward trend, which again, people did not know whether it was going to continue to go down or just, you know, continue to, to go down in a more steeper way. This uptick represents basically 1918 through 1920s, uh, through the late 1920s, um, when a boom starts to happen, which I'll talk a little bit in a second. And then this is the Great Depression. Um, so, you know, all gains lost and even further back than we had been before in terms of ownership rates. Um, and then um, in the 40s, this is when we start to get the federal government's interventions on the housing market and we reach, um, U.S. reaches the 50% mark for the first time right around the late 40s, early 50s. And then this is the rest of the story as we know it right now. Um, okay, so facing eroding ownership rates at the turn of the um, century, the National Association of Real Estate Boards, the NAR, R-E-B, which is we now know as the NAR, the National Association of Realtors, with the copyright at the end. Um, they're the reason we have to cop that that term is copyrighted. Um, in partnership with the state, began in the 1910s to aggressively promote ownership, not just as a choice, but as a duty, a noble calling, and as a racial capacity. While philosophers, states, and settlers had long invoked the idea of the inherent property capacity of whites to justify a slew of maneuvers and laws in specific national contexts. So this thinking goes back to John Locke, the philosopher, the Enlightenment philosopher, who made the argument that Native Americans weren't using the land, right? And whites knew how to use and manage and privatize the land, and thusly they had they had the right to take the land, right? So justifying um, um, settlement in all different kinds of ways. There are a lot of racial arguments that have been made since the Enlightenment justifying white settler colonialism. Um, that we see that those ideas start to uh, morph, but kind of maintain themselves in the late 19th century um, as they start to um, reorganize themselves around Anglo-Saxon identity, which becomes a kind of global white diasporic identity category in the late 19th century. So conjuring an image of global white diasporic community united by the bonds of race, the reclamation of Anglo-Saxon heritage in this period served to stabilize a trans-historical and transnational vision of white supremacy. Drawing from the racialized arguments made to justify land grabs in the name of empire, settler colonialism, and expansion across the globe, so in Australia and South Africa, as well as the US, Canada, et cetera, American realtors repurposed this language to convince white Americans that the stakes of investing in domestic residential property were just as immense as extraterritorial expansion. So I'm not gonna talk about this in depth, but I just, oh, I don't know why this is so funky. Um, uh, but I just wanna give you a sense of, you know, some of the language that you find in these very early real estate journals and, and magazines to describe, um, you know, white right to the land and using this to kind of incubate burgeoning arguments for residential mass home ownership. Um, so I'll try to read around this, I don't know why it looks like this. Um, 
Uh, it is therefore essential that its ownership uh, at all times be a matter of public record and uh, I'm not gonna be able to read it. And uh, I'll just go to another one. Um, it was distinctively an Anglo-Saxon institution. We're talking about ownership, property law, and probably never could have existed and could not now exist in all of its fullness among other people. Um, it seems inevitable that this race, the Anglo-Saxon race, shall be the world's dominant power for a long time to come. And again, tying that power to a kind of innate capacity to not just rule, but to own, right? This idea that ownership itself was this racial capacity that needed to be, um, um, and not just a cultural capacity, not just like the origins of private property law or in Great Britain, we get some of those arguments, but some of these become much more um, biological in nature, right? That ownership itself is a white capacity. So part of what I've been doing is trying to track this language in early real estate um, um, archives, right? And think about how it was shaping um, the ways that realtors were understanding race and understanding basically the early um, hallmarks of redlining. Um, real estate um, also kind of gets a new charge after 1917 and the Russian Revolution. And so the state starts getting really interested in home ownership after 1917 because the thinking was that the problem with Russia, right, is that not enough people own the land and people don't revolt when they own their homes. So the U.S. state gets really invested in the idea that if we can inculcate mass home ownership, maybe we won't have a revolution in the U.S. So this is when the state really starts to get involved in home ownership and thinking about it as not just, you know, something helpful, right, but it's something integral to national security. Um, and so this is where you get things like the own your own home campaign that Hoover starts and you get all of this language about uh, Bolsheviks, anarchists, reds. And the fact, the problem with the anarchists is they don't own. And if we can just turn them into homeowners, um, then we'll have a solution, right? Um, so I kind of track some of this language and that's really important to like the whole foundation of the book that I'm trying to write. Um, um, it's kind of re recapturing the story that really quite hasn't been told, um, going back as far as it goes. Like um, we tend to talk about anchor this, the story of redlining in the post-war period in the 20, in the 30s and the 40s, um, but it's really the turn of the century, right, where these arguments start to get built. Um, okay, so the last little bit that I have, I'm going to turn to the 1930s, um, uh, which is where I'm, what I'm working on right now. Uh, where the inroads towards home ownership made in the previous decade, bolstered by public-private propaganda initiatives, threatened to collapse. Um, so even prior to the crash, realtors worried amongst themselves that peddling home ownership sentimental ideology had limited efficacy without a larger restructuring of home financing, making mass ownership stable and viable in the long term. Like we can keep pushing and pushing home ownership, but unless we make it affordable, we're going to max out. Is what realtors were warning. And the Great Depression absolutely validated these fears by laying bare ownership's volatilities, severely testing the nation's faith in ownership's property gospel. The large down payments and short-term mortgages required to own in the early 20th century set the stage for the decade's widespread dispossessions. As credit dried up and unemployment surged, property owners struggled to make payments or secure second mortgages, leading to mass foreclosures where owners lost both their down payments and their homes. So in the first few years of the depression, a third of farmers lost their land to foreclosure, nearly half of all residential loans were delinquent, and home values declined 30% between 1928 and 1933. So like, no matter what kind of property you owned or where, most exper Americans experienced the precarity of ownership in some form, right? Whether you were in the city, whether you were in the country, um, you know, the Great Depression either affected you or affected someone that you knew in terms of their, their relationship to property. The housing reforms of the New Deal would eventually soothe this property, soothe the property scars of white Americans burnt by foreclosure and default during the Great Depression. By the 50s, the state's efforts to subsidize the private lending market would turn the owned home for an expanded category of white Americans into an affordable and stable asset for both accruing wealth and passing it down. But from the vantage point of the 1930s, go to the slide, um, widespread home ownership for even the white middle class seemed far from certain. In fact, a number of social critics insisted that uh, the nation's future depended upon destroying the sentimental myths of ownership's absolute virtues once and for all um, in order for an expanded conception of good housing to take hold. So um, in articles published like these, published in the New Republican Survey Graphic and in standalone monographs, 
Economists, journalists, and local officials insisted that the only way to keep people decently sheltered was for the government to stop reifying ownership and to start financing and subsidizing housing of all varieties. You get things like the case against home ownership, more homes or more mortgages, the great challenge of housing and what it implies. So people are really starting to question like, well, is home ownership the way to go? Why? <laughs> How do we break out of this? If we actually want good housing, maybe we shouldn't fetishize ownership. Maybe we should find other ways. This is also at the moment where there are a lot of vocal advocates for public housing at the time too, right? So there's a real um, 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 raucous public conversation about um, not just housing, right, but the forms of ownership behind housing um, or the, the forms of occupation, the various forms of occupation other than ownership. Um, but such an overhaul in housing policy, such critics like these um, acknowledge would fail if the structures of good feeling yoke to ownership weren't also dismantled. So as a journalist, as journalist Rose Stein wrote, quote, in third, 1932, quote, every prospective home buyer should be immunized with an antitoxin against the blah blah of own your own home campaigns. Economist Stuart Chase echoed those sentiments in 1938, describing the desire for home ownership as a cultural lag that was, quote, based more on sentiment and emotion than on facts. Home and mother, the misty eye, the silent tear, the couplet of Eddie Guest, it is one of those immoral principles, splendid for things in general, but often disastrous for you and me and Adam. Um, the chairman of the New York City Housing Authority similarly said, quote, uh, bemoaned what he deemed, quote, the wicked exploitation of the natural desire to own a home, which has swept the country during the 1920s. Um, so these critics agreed that the providing better housing to the masses entailed shaking the nation's faith and ownership's uncontested providence. That was like an emotional problem. We had to break people's emotional sensorium around housing and rebuild it differently, right? It wasn't just an economic problem. It was a problem with feeling that had to be addressed. Um, so the charge to deconfect from ownership was answered by cultural production from the 30s in a number of ways. Writers, filmmakers, and artists persistently represented the trials and tribulations as well as a series of bad feelings accompanying ownership. The pain of property lost and denied anchored a range of reformed epics, reparative melodramas, and didactic satires in the decade, confronting the trauma of dispossession to only deepen their hunger for ownership stability, ultimately reifying homeownership as the horizon of American inspiration. Others actively combated the misty eye and the silent tear long associated with the own hearth, narratives that satirize homeownership. Uh, but no matter whether a work glorified property or narrated the process of becoming disillusioned with its promises for good, narratives of the 1930s regularly centered property as a problem both economic and affective in nature. The question of how it felt to be owned and to be disowned or to be denied access to ownership at all, alongside the moral and financial value of ownership were all up for grabs in this decade. So these are just some of the representations I'm thinking with. There are two Betty Boop um, cartoons, separate cartoons about foreclosure and dispossession that emerged in the 1930s. One that's a rural farmstead and one uh, where she lives in a kind of residential suburb and then eventually, um, uh, the planets are all bidding um, to own a uh, foreclosed upon planet Earth. Um, this is just so how, like, how much like the representation of dispossession was central to the culture. Um, Gone with the Wind, obviously, Grapes of Wrath, um, um, even something like, um, uh, oh my gosh, I just blanked on the name of um, <laughs> Wizard of Oz, <laughs> it's I've been talking too long, uh, which in the original books had a kind of foreclosure plot line. Um, that you could kind of think about that the house being lost in the tornado also kind of um, uh, making reference to the kind of mass foreclosures happening in the period. So like this question of foreclosure and the kind of emotional atmosphere of dispossession is all over um, the, the, the literature of the 1930s. And part of what I'm trying to work through in this chapter is, okay, given how much people were, you know, given these narratives and the ways that people were trying to work through what it meant to, to, to be dispossessed, um, how does property survive? Like, how does ownership come back stronger on the other side? One easy answer, I think, um, probably the most straightforward answer is to say, um, because of the, the state intervenes, right? It produces all these new housing programs that subsidizes white ownership of, of housing in the suburbs and helps to construct and subsidize the construction of suburbs, right? Um, to produce a kind of um, easier relationship to ownership um, after the kind of onerous period of the Great Depression. Um, but I'm interested in the ways that, you know, culture of the 1930s also facilitated that kind of 
coming back to property, right? And making property like the end all and be all um, and kind of retethering the ties, not just between the American populace and property, but white Americans in particular and property. So that's what I'm trying to trace partially in this, in this chapter. But the other part of this chapter I'm trying to focus on, and I'll just tease a little bit today because I really want to get to Q&A, is thinking about how Black writers and thinkers were also kind of um, working through questions of the, the kind of racialized questions of dispossession in this period, not just in the, in the face of the Great Depression, um, where Blacks were even harder hit by foreclosure and dispossession um, in the 1930s, but also in the wake of the Great Migration, where many African Americans were leaving behind rural space, farmsteads that they may have owned or sharecropped for uncertain futures in the North where ownership was even further away as an aspiration. So right, what does it mean for Blacks to be giving up on mass on the idea of a kind of Jeffersonian idea of the yeoman farmer in the South and moving um, um, voluntarily into um, rental districts in the North? Like what kind of property imagination, residential shift is happening there too that I'm trying to capture. Um, so maybe I'll just quickly talk about um, the cases I said I was gonna talk about, but again, I wanna, I wanna, wanna short change Q&A um, about Du Bois and, and, and Richard Wright um, writing about, um, who have two different ways of thinking about um, property um, and particularly the era of reconstruction in the 1930s. Um, Reconstruction was often thought of as a as a um, as a kind of historical analog for the Great Depression for a number of ways. Like they both shared like massive forms of migration, people resettling after the Civil War and after the Great Depression, um, uh, massive state driven rebuilding efforts, <laughs> the New Deal and Reconstruction, um, but also um, uh, the normalization of extra state racial violence. That also ap appears in the wake of the civil of the civil war and reconstruction. So there are a lot of people thinking about the relationship to reconstruction and the Great Depression. Um, and probably the kind of one of the most famous texts to, 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 to be thinking about um, reconstruction, the history of black relationship to property in the 30s is Du Bois's, W.B. Du Bois's kind of massive um, 700 page book, uh, Black Reconstruction in America. Um, and in this book, he's really trying to recover Reconstruction as a splendid failure, as this point of possibility where Blacks could have, with more help from the state, um, and uh, with that, with a kind of um, genuine partnership with the white, white working class, could have actually produced a kind of more e equal America, right? But he's kind of, he kind of points out those points of possibility in the Reconstruction period before denoting um, their fizzling. Um, one of the things that I'm super interested in, in in this book is the ways that Du Bois particularly talks about Black desire for the land. Um, he continually mourns the lost opportunity to massively redistribute Southern land to the freed persons who had worked it. So he says things like this. Um, if the basic problem of reconstruction in the South was economic, the kernel of the economic situation was the land. Um, the Negro unerringly and insistently led the way um, and realizing the importance of, of land, Du Bois argues, um, and he insists that the main question to which Negroes returned again and again was the problem of owning the land. Um, so Du Bois' argument about the land's importance to freed persons during Reconstruction largely rests on his naturalization of Black yearning for possession. Such an approach not only spoke back to Reconstruction historiography, but also rebutted more contemporary claims forwarded by realtors and land ec economists that Blacks specifically migrants from the South were hard on property due to a mixture of apathy and experience and predisposition for degeneration that spread to all they touched. So this is part of the impetus for redlining, right? It was this belief um, that Blacks did not know how to own and did not know how to maintain property, right? This is part of the argument for the devaluation of Black neighborhoods, right? Uh, that the devaluation was not because of a lack because of the lack of resources allotted to those neighborhoods, which is the truth, but that the blame was actually on African Americans who, because of a legacy of being property and not owning property, did not know how to take care of property. So given those kind of debates, I'm interested in connecting those debates that are happening to the claims that Du Bois is making and underscoring in Black Reconstruction, right? That um, actually, you know, Blacks were the only ones who understood the land, the only ones who appreciated land and reconstruction, thinking about how the Great Depression and the real estate market of the present is shaping the ways he's also thinking about um, Black ownership and its possibilities in the past. Um, 
And then I juxtapose like Du Bois is kind of fetishizing of black ownership um, with uh, the different take that someone like Richard Wright offers in a book from 1941 called 12 Million Black Voices, uh, which is a photo text where he takes um, images from the Farm Security Administration's photographic archive and creates this kind of poetic text that describes um, centuries of black life um, um, from encounter, from African encounter um, to the present. Um, and this text is very interesting because where Du Bois spends 700 pages talking about reconstruction, um, Richard Wright spends one paragraph. Um, and uh, in this paragraph, he's, he's interested in, in some ways, de-emphasizing the importance of land to the Black imaginary. Um, he says things like this, uh, glad to be free, some of us drifted and gave way to every vagary, confined for centuries, centuries to the life of the cotton field. Many of us possess no feelings of family, home, community, race. Um, just as a kitchen kitten stretches and yawns, so thousands of us tramp from place to place for the sheer sake of moving, looking, wondering, land, landless upon the land. Um, so whereas Du Bois detailed a reconstructing the ethos organized around black hunger for the land, Wright presents this period as one where Blacks tested out what it might look like to be free of it for good. For Wright, the most meaningful way to reconstruct was to turn one's back on the land for good um, and, and, and to wander and find other ways of ownership, dwelling, um, and being together. Um, I want to come, I want to talk about this last quote from Wright, um, where um, if the sovereign possession of property is not the end game for Black liberation, Wright suggests a vision of reconstruction organized around the broken promise of 40 acres and a mule becomes less pivotal, just one more iteration of Black injury during the long regime of racial capitalism, rather than an event of any particular use or useful value as the boys frames it. So for Wright, nothing different happens in reconstruction, right? Um, so there's no point in dwelling on it, right? Whereas Du Bois sees all this possibility of what could have happened. Um, and this is the, the, these are my closing lines. So Wright ultimately posits a positive vision for reconstruction in 12 million black voices rooted not in ownership or the family unit, but in collectivization. He says, quote, after having been pulverized by slavery and perch of our heritage, we are unable to establish our family groups upon a basis of property ownership. For the most part, our delicate families are held together by love, sympathy, pity, and the goading knowledge that we must work together to make a crop. So the Moynihan Report of 1965 would later declare the divergence of some Black family structures from traditional bourgeois norms to be a handicap to be overcome. But Richard Wright claims divergent Black family organizations purposefully unoptimized for capitalist reproduction as a strength. In the wake of slavery, the alleged pulverizations of Black culture, as well as ongoing Black exclusion from avenues of advancement, Wright cast the Black folk as revolutionaries already decentering de private property in both their residential and working lives. As many Blacks in the early 20th century continue to give up on Southern land ownership to move into red line Northern cities with few avenues for ownership. And as the Great Depression's long shadow continued to further lay bare ownership's pitfalls, the utility of Reconstruction's broken property promises remained an open question. Du Bois's emphasis on Black desire for land possession during the post-emancipation era stages ownership as the ongoing fertile terrain for Black enfranchisement. Wright, on the other hand, mines the same period for its latent revolutionary animus rooted in Black rejection of owned land, begetting new social collectives. For both of these thinkers, the historical question of Black orientation to ownership had direct consequences for defining its meaningfulness within the property regimes and real estate imaginaries of their immediate present. 40 acres and a mule emerges for them not so much as the given terrain for reparations, but as a cipher for valuing mass ownership itself as a social, economic, affective, and political animus for Black life, past and present. Okay, now I'm done. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank there you. you go. Thank you for bearing with me, I know that was a lot. <laughs> So much. I think this is a lecture that I know I'm going to listen to more than once because it's so broad and has so much depth all the way from intersection of race and space, perception, reading of space, cities, rural, urban, suburban, uh, alternative forms of property, finance, 
Oh, Lindsay can't hear you anymore. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Britt has a thumbs up. We can hear you. Yes. Definitely okay. hear you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyways, so um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat or raise your emoji hand. I see Jack Ryan has an um, emoji hand up. Do you want to jump right in? Sure. Um, wait, can you, you can hear me? No, yes. Um, yeah. OK. So this is kind of like a little bit of a, a loaded question. I don't know if you've heard of the New York Times columnist, Charles Blow. Yeah, so he did um, a podcast with um, Stephen J. Dubner, who's fairly well known. He does the Freakonomics radio about, um, like just I'm reading a little blurb about it, about a uh, reverse migration to the South to consolidate political power and create a region where it's safe to be black. Mm -hmm. I was wondering with your ideas that you talked about um, black housing and throughout the United States and throughout time, what you thought about his idea of like reverse migration and if it was even feasible. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I know a little bit about the, the Charles Bull argument though. I would, I, I'm not, I haven't read it recently. Um, um, and if I understand it correctly, you know, there has been a kind of reverse migration happening for decades at this point, um, uh, where African Americans in particular are migrating back to the South because of lower housing prices for a number of different reasons. And migration was never a kind of straightforward trajectory anyway. Even, you know, people who had migrated during the Great Migration were often coming back and forth um, and bringing family members and returning to the South at various moments. So in some ways, when we tend to when we talk about migration, the Great Migration, I think we get the story wrong. We think about it as like a kind of final movement. But um, we, I think Charles Blow's argument is really interesting. And again, I just know the Atlanta context a little, a little better. And I, I think that's central to his argument, right? And, you know, Atlanta is interesting, right? Because Atlanta has a history of Black suburban ownership um, that's very different than other cities um, and the way that, because of the way that Atlanta was structured and, and the kind of particular norms of the versions of segregation that <laughs> happen in Atlanta versus in other places. Um, um, it's interesting that that reverse migration um, is continues, you know, that the, the role that Atlanta kind of continues to play in that imaginary. Um, and, you know, I guess I don't have any thoughts about it, except to kind of tie it back to the, to the work of like Du Bois and Wright, who are kind of co always talking about like the pros and cons and what it means to leave and what it means to come back, right? And that those questions of like, what, what does it mean to amass power? When and where can you amass power? And how does that dictate where and when and how you live, right? That those conversations have always been a part of, of Black life. And, um, you know, um, yeah. So I guess my only impulse is to try to like, as a, as a literature person, as someone who always is thinking historically, right? To kind of trace this kind of newish version of that argument, I think, to the kind of longer, um, the longer arc of Black thought around, you know, um, how to think about space as a kind of viable engine for um, for for political making, right? Um, so, um, but you make me want to. Re I haven't listened listen to that podcast, so I'm going to write it down and make sure that I I've listened to Freakonomics, but not that um, yeah. episode. So, thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much. I like found this so interesting. So, yeah. If anyone has that podcast at the tip of their fingers, you could also <laughs> drop it in the chat for all of us to access. Um, uh, and Brian Kelly has his emoji hand up. Oh, you're muted, Brian. I thought I took, I, th I actually found I had an emoji hand for once. Um, <laughs> so, so Adrian, what a wonderful presentation and, and how incredibly timely. I mean, if you think about it, the legacy of, um, of Fred Trump and his mother Elizabeth is essentially this. And the yes. uh, person whose name I will not say out loud um, is basically the beneficiary of this racist uh, system. To me, it's interesting to think about the it's almost diabolical way in which real estate, banking, insurance, 
uh, and city planning, along with marketing and the media, yeah. all come. So I imagine some some there must be in Chicago. It's the University Club or one of those clubby places that this took place in New York. It's the Century Club or University mm -hmm. Club in New York. What, what is the, the the mechanism that brought together? these people to basically set up basically a Ponzi scheme. Because if we take race out of it and ethnicity out of it, the whole thing starts to unravel very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the question is that, it, what was the vehicle that, that, that managed to make the links between, you know, I, I understand the re relationship between real estate and insurance, because every time you go into a real estate broker's office, right next door they have an insurance office yeah. but what is the vehicle that brought all these things together i think is very uh, uh, in my mind a big question yeah this it's a really good. great question and, and a, fant a fantastic question even and um my understanding of what makes what brings all of these kind of bureaucratic institutional partners together is the failure of segregation laws right so baltimore for instance passes can't remember the date i think it's 1907 or 1908 they try to pass a wide sweeping law making it you know uh making segregate making residential segregation law um, and that law struck down and a couple of other cities tried to um, um basically institutionalize residential segregation through legal means right and they keep being told you can't do it that way <laughs> like that is not constitutional right so then what happens is that realtor, realtors need to find other ways right and state agencies also need to find other ways um, to uh, produce residential segregation in ways that can pass muster with the, with the law, right? And so that's where you get covenants, right? Covenants are the first uh, <laughs> thing that, you know, because, uh, because they're private agreements, right? And they're not regulated by the law, right? They can pass. And I think it's part of this larger shift of what happens in the U.S. In the 20th, across the 20th century, where um, it's a shift from, let's say, in the 1920s, right? If a Black family moved onto a white block, they would be subject to harassment. And they would be told if you ask their white neighbor why they didn't want to live next to someone who was black, that person would lar largely say something like they're inferior, right? Or they could have said something like, we don't believe in mixing, we think they're inferior, right? Like, uh, they're dangerous, blah, blah, blah. By the time you get to the 1950s, right, the language has changed, right? Um, and the language is, I actually don't, please do not move into my neighborhood because you're going to lower my property value, right? So it's the, in some ways, it's the tethering of whiteness to the value of property. And the way that that gets regulated is it's not so much what happens on the block, right? If a black family moves onto a white block in the 1950s, something has gone haywire much earlier in the process because you have this whole bureaucratic apparatus that gets built in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s to prevent that interpersonal relationship even having to enter into the equation, right? It's the realtor who's deciding um, whether they're gonna even show someone the neighborhood, right? Or it's the banker who's deciding whether someone's gonna get the loan that they would need to afford to move into a white neighborhood. So, so much of the, what happens is, I think because of um, the failures of the laws to uphold um, um, firm segregation is that these institutions get very good in building bureaucratic apparatus to protect it. And they make it even more um, um, impervious because they become the ones who handle residential segregation. So it becomes invisibilized and bureaucratic and it's not loud, it's not noisy. It's not like the explosive confrontation of, um, I think I showed a picture of that Norman Rockwell picture of um, uh, that famous image of like, the black kids and the white kids, and they moved into the suburban neighborhood. Like, that's the story people want to try to tell about the mid-century, but most often the story of segregation is very quiet because it just happens bureaucratically and institutionally. Um, and it's not explosive like it was in the earlier parts of the 20th century because of this kind of quiet apparatus that made a lot of money also from, <laughs> from segregation because you could charge blacks so much more money, right? Um, and that's what we're starting to learn about reparations, not just thinking about slavery, obviously, but like how much wealth was actually actively extracted from the black community when they were locked out of home ownership, when they were entered into exploitative um, contracts to try to own, right, that were marked up, you know, um, in crazy ways or the high rents that African Americans paid in Harlem in the 20s, 30s and 40s, 50s, 60s, often double what someone, a white 
New Yorker was paying in Greenwich Village to rent in terrible housing, right? So like all of this apparatus, um, it became very profitable too. So, um, um, and that's kind of like, that's, this is the kind of story I want to tell. Like, how do you tell this quieter story? <laughs> And, and I'm, imagining, sight, I'm, right? I'm imagining that part of that is, you know, it's trying to be a fly on the wall of, let's say, the Century Club or let's say the fly mm -hmm. on the wall of, of um, an interlocking directorate. Yes. So I imagine, I imagine that if you're a realtor, you want to sit on the board of directors of a bank someplace. Yes. And that this 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 whole thing is at at uh, at at least it's complicit and at worst it's all collusion. Yes, I mean, this is also, a lot of, but I'm sure it is. And, yes. I, and to imagine that story and how that gets engineered in the most vile way possible is is just frightening, actually. And it helps. Yeah, it's, it helps it's, it's built into the, the, yes, it's built into the profession, professional, like the professionalization of real estate itself. Like they become a lobbying entity in the 1910s, that's when they get in with Hoover, right? Like it's all, they start to realize the power of becoming a guild before the 20th century. Real estate was a real ragtag, unprofessional enterprise. But once they become to associate and become build boards and guilds, right? That's when, you know, those kinds of conversations that you're marking, for, like they really do, you know, if you go to the archive, the National Association of Realtors, not only do they have an archive, they have an archivist. So you can see their memos and you can see, I mean, a lot of what I pulled from is from the internal um, journal that, that, that was only meant to really circulate to realtors, right? Where you can see them testing out new language or new sales pitches, right? And how to talk about race and how to create a new rhetoric around race. Like you can, you know, it's there in the archive if we go to, to look at it, but even what wasn't, I mean, I think what you're saying, like what wasn't captured in the archive is probably even worse. But, but, but just as a lesson, this is what we're witnessing with voting rights. Well, no, no, we're not taking away voting rights. We're working around the fringes of this. Yes. And, and this way of working around the fringes is really the vile thing. Yeah. Very important topic. Um, I think uh, there's a few questions in the chat. I want to make sure that we cover lots of questions too. Um, I think Julie's second question, um, and I'll read it uh, for anyone who's not seeing it in the chat. Um, she says, in our housing studio, we are speculating about why Europeans have social housing and we largely do not, certainly not for the middle class. Is it an oversimplification to say that's due to racism? Um, it's never an oversimplification. <laughs> I mean, it's always a big part of the story. Um, I don't, I think it often doesn't get emphasized enough. I mean, yes, there are other factors at play. Um, and, you know, a fear of, of radicalization. Again, I talked, to, I gestured a little bit to the Russian Revolution, the way that was really shaping American imaginaries of anything public um, after 19, mm. before 1917, and it becomes intensified after 1917. Um, I mean, this is also a period, right, where we do get some European style social housing, um, you know, in the 20s and 30s, these huge bills are passed and we do get the beginning the in, you know, never as big as in Europe, and though the the housers who are advocating for public housing are certainly studying Europe, right, and trying to make an argument. Like some of the people that I flagged as making the argument against home ownership, were very heavily also making the argument for public housing, right? It's this other way of of thinking about how to keep people housed that isn't so much about fetishizing ownership, right? But I think what you see in the in the public housing that does get built in the US, right? That from the beginning, the question of race is a huge problem mm -hmm. for public housing, right? How, if we're gonna have public housing for all, does that mean in public housing is integrated, right? Um, could it be or could it be in the ways that public housing increasingly becomes racialized, right? And, and the racialization of public housing becomes the kind of motive for tearing it down, right? And destroying it, right? We see the ways that racialization is so key to the story of public housing in the in, in, the, in the American imaginary. Um, and so uh, my hunch is my not my hunch, but yes, it's there from the start when people are having these conversations about how people should be housed and who controls where people live, right? Um, but that question of race is is there too, and it just becomes more intensified as as, as the story of public housing progresses in the U.S. I got a, a private chat that builds on this um, fetishization of ownership. Um, and the question reads, how does the fetishization of ownership manifest in space, both in form of buildings, but also in, also in morphology of communities? So not just where, but in maybe building type or 
um, community planning sort of more broadly? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, you know, I, I think a little bit about this and I want to think a little bit more and I'll try to answer this question in a second. I think the book that is that does answer this question in a beautiful and direct way is Diane Harris's um, Little White Houses. It's a great, great, great book. And um, she's, an she's an actual architectural historian um, and uh, has done, you know, her, her whole book is really thinking about the kind of creation of, 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 of suburban housing, the test housing that happens through various corporations and thinking about the ways that race and whiteness were part of the kind of emergent um, imaginary of these different typologies. So um, Diane's work, I think, is like fantastic on this front. I mean, one thing that I have been thinking about on this um, in relationship to this, coming out of, out of the Black skyscraper and thinking about how much verticality and density and scale put pressure on people's racial perception, right? And almost threatened to break it, right? Um, this idea that you couldn't tell who was why where and how you got race for the three rooms, diversity, that's a relatively new term that gets invented in the 20s and 30s. Um, before that, a racial difference is a racial difference. Um, there's no such thing as ethnicity per se. And so this idea of all of these different racial groups already coming to the US being complicated by density and verticality. Um, you know, one of the things I'm interested in the way is that horizontality and less dense residential spaces also caught, you know, helps soothe a certain kind of racial per, um, perception as well, right? Mm. Um, uh, where there is much more control over your environment um, and a different way of kind of seeing bodies and interacting with them um, that, I think is important to understanding how like the history of racial perception itself unfolds in the US. Um, so this is like, you know, one of the arguments that I'm interested in making is that like architects need to think more about race, but people who think about race need to think way more about architecture because, you know, um, like forms of ha housing typologies, density, these are all changing the ways that we move through the world and how we see. And so like, I'm super interested in trying to, you know, um, think about this even more. The other place that I'm starting to think about this in the book is through commuting. And like what kind mm. of an experience is community moving from city to center? I mean, it's really important for like a literary story of like the New Yorker and the short story as a form that you could read on the train explodes in the mid century. Uh, but I'm interested in the ways that those stories are in the New Yorker. They're so much about whiteness and what does it mean to like have a new understanding of suburban whiteness are also emerging and how much like commuting time actually shapes that. So um, this is to say I'm beginning to think about those questions and I think they're super important and kind of the most weird and interesting and, and um, the hardest to think about because they require you to kind of denaturalize the way you move through the world and, and not take for granted the way that you move through the world is the way that people have always moved through the world and encountered race and had questions about race. So uh, really important stuff. Yeah, that, I mean, that's fascinating. And I think has so much to do with how we try to practice as architects thinking about the space, about space and plan and section um, as uh, a kind of pure or just document, like documentation, but the, the embedded nature and the subjective nature of actually what that means is totally different mm -hmm. um, and totally taken for granted. Mm -hmm. Does, does anyone, I don't see any emoji hands. Um, there's a few more things in the chat, but does anyone want to just unmute and ask a question or chime in? Yes. I want to ask a follow-up about that question. Well, first of all, it's amazing to hear about the built environment through eyes that are not from an architect, planner, or real estate edge, um, uh, real estate or um, you know something like that. So it's fantastic to sort of hear your humanist point of view, but I'm wondering if you can talk more about, you just talked, you sort of answered my question and talked about commuting, but were there other cultural impacts on urban centers that were a result of own your own home campaign aside from like white flight and commuting? Yeah, that's a really good question. Are you asking like like forms that immediately emerge out of like these new, like the, the growth of mass home ownership as a kind of cultural phenomenon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, um, yeah, let me think about that. I mean, I'm trying to argue yes. <laughs> and I'm trying to think about where they are. So like the aesthetics that, you know, the, the new aesthetics that emerge out of this, right? And like one place I've been thinking about this is in terms of death, 
So, you know, the 30 year mortgage is a brand new phenomenon, as I suggested in the 30s. Like before, there was no such thing as, you know, it was eight, it was five, 10, 10 max. Maybe sometimes you would get 15, but it was five to 10. And that was like the lifetime of, of, of the kind of debt that you would, you know, that you would accrue for, uh, you know, that was the term. And just think about what does it mean um, when people have 30 year mortgages? Like, what is the ex experience of that kind of debt? And thinking about a kind of 30 year, <laughs> form of debt that you have to pay back and like what kind of different ways of thinking about time <laughs> and thinking about ownership um, that get produced out of that phenomenon. So like in some ways what I'm trying to do is is say like we have this category of something called suburban literature that we think looks or so suburban aesthetics right that look a certain way but it's like well what is that what is it actually comprised of like okay how does debt shape that kind of experience of what does it mean to think of yourself as a homeowner as um, a white subject who most often had access to 30 year mortgages like that fo debt form itself is highly racialized in the in the turn of the century because of the FHA's policies right and so that's like one place where I'm trying to track this it's like well how does that experience of get debt get manifested in cultural forms and things like that um, you know one thing I've been also tracing is like the emergence or the um, of something called more or the reemergence of something called mortgage melodrama um, that's an old form that comes from like Europe, France, and Ireland in the like 18th century. Um, but um, that on the stage, you see so many more productions that are interested in the plot device of the mortgage, really starting in the 20s. Um, and you can kind of see that in film too, right? But the mortgage as this as this everyday kind of plot mecha mechanism and device, right? Um, just trying to think about how that shapes the way that people think about goodness and badness and like who's the bad guy in a mortgage melodrama and the fear of the landlord which I'm trying to take up in the 1960s in relationship to urban renewal so um you know the question you asked Brittany is like exactly the question that I'm I'm hoping that I'll have a better answer to as I continue to write this book what when can we buy it <laughs> yeah that's a really good question I was uh hopefully I'll finish it in like the next year and then it'll be out, but um, I'm about a third of the way, a halfway through. I'll say halfway through. Um, I I will plug the um the MoMA written companion that you can purchase. That's got an article that Adrian wrote in it. Yeah, the stuff I kind of sped sped through at the end of this on Du Bois and Richard Wright. Um, the fuller version of that is out in the um the field guide for the Black Reconstructions exhibit. So that term reconstructions was one that we kind of came up with as the advisory council. They had a, a way worse title before that. Um, and so the idea of reconstructions as a way of thinking about this historical period where black ownership is such an interesting question and the origins of like the push for reparations, um, but thinking about the kind of imaginaries of black building and, and construction and re what kind of a possibility a reconstruction meant like an imaginary reconstruction versus other terms like repair um, might have like that's really um, I try I try to think about that in this in this MoMA volume and if you can get to the New York to see it um, which I haven't yet done uh, it, the exhibit seems incredible so I'm really excited to see it well I really do not want to cut this conversation short because there's so much to talk about and it's so, so wonderful to have you with us, Adrian. So um, I'll be here if anyone wants to keep talking, but I think in the meantime, a very warm, very loud virtual round of applause. Thank you so, 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 so much for talking with us about your work. Um, and I think it, it's, yeah, everyone's sort of gonna, be waiting to hear. We'll send out a news blast about the book whenever, whenever it's available. But um, I think this is a great introduction to your work. And I think everyone will be following up to learn more. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, everybody. Like I said, I'm really indebted to, to the Architecture School of Maryland. So like, this is, I started to learn to think about some of the stuff there, whether you knew it or not. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a real thrill to be here and, and to talk to everybody. We didn't even have time to pick up that um, sort of thread you dropped earlier <laughs> about, okay. about what it, yeah, like sort of what it means to have these long sort of career long investigations mm -hmm. and where they start and where they come from. Mm -hmm.
Adrian, thank you for coming back virtually to College Park. We really appreciate seeing a Terrapin do fantastically well like yourself. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Stopping the recording.